To win the pole position for a race can be interpreted in many different ways. You will most certainly make the headlines as the driver to not mess with when race day arrives. You have the opportunity of an early advantage in comparison to the other cars in the field. Some drivers can use the opportunity to straight up dominate a race. Others fall to a poor race pace in comparison to having just a few laps, aka long run versus short run. But every now and then, people may call it a curse, no matter how inconsistent history may be. Some people will look at patterns and say, alright, it's a curse every 2-3 to three years, so whoever wins it now will be a bust for life. Wow, that is harsh. Those analysis can be found a lot in motorsports, especially in NASCAR. The way NASCAR does their qualifying, to quickly clarify, is fairly simple. Run two laps around the circuit and you'll get a place on the board. Back in the old days, if there was let's say 43 car limit to a race, and over 60 drivers showed up, that's a lot of people going home, and it doesn't matter if your lap times suck or you crash. Nowadays, only super speedways use that format, somewhat, and the upcoming 2022 season is going to have a ton of complicated changes on other tracks. Along with this, there are these expensive things called charters which easily help someone automatically keep their spot for the race. If you don't have a charter, then ouch, that's a bummer. At least if more drivers in the limit show up and you fail to get in, let's say. However, it's a different story when it comes to a time such as Daytona Speed Weeks, as a pair of qualifying races are used to help those that may just fall a little short of first in qualifying, known as the Blue Greens Vacations Duel, or formerly known as the Twin 125s. Whoever wins the Daytona 500 pole on qualifying day doesn't need to exactly worry a whole lot in their respective dual race, except for one thing, don't crash or blow an engine. If you do, you're likely going to the back, especially if the damage is bad. There have been many times where a scenario like this happened where a driver scored the fastest time in qualifying, but fell to poor luck in their dual race, or perhaps something happened during practice. In 1990, Kenny Schrader won his third straight Daytona 500 pole with the fastest speed of 196.515 mph. After failing to win the 500 in 1988 and 1989, despite winning his dual race and falling short to Darrell Waltrip in the latter year, Schrader looked to finally get the win in 1990. Unfortunately, out of all places and times to have this happen, he crashed coming in a turn 4 on the last lap during his dual race and he had to give up his spot to Jeff Bodine in the 500. Ironically enough, in a sad way though, that year's 500 saw Dale Earnhardt have a tire failure on the last lap giving Derek Cope the win, and Schrader and Earnhardt would later tangle together in a last lap crash just 11 years later during the 2001 Daytona 500. Such a strange story of fate and irony right there. A similar situation wouldn't happen until 2004 when Cup Series sophomore Greg Biffle scored his first career Daytona 500 pole. An engine failure during the final practice session sent him to the back of the field on race day, and he wound up finishing 12th in the 500. If you want to find a sense of curse in this case, I suppose Biffle never winning a championship could be chosen. But here's where things get strange. The winner of that year's 500 would be Dale Earnhardt Jr. who ironically won three years after his father's death. Yeah, you see where that gets eerie? Add more irony to the fact that Jr. won the pole for the 2011 Daytona 500 which was the 10th anniversary of his father's death. And then just a few days later, a crash in practice caused him to fall to the back, giving Kurt Busch the top spot after he won his respective dual race. The winner of the 2011 500 would end up being none other than Trevor Bain, who scored his first career Cup Series victory in just his second career race in one of the biggest Cinderella stories in NASCAR history. I'll freak you out even more by saying that in 2001, the winner was also a first-timer, being Dale Earnhardt Incorporated driver Michael Waltrip, although he did take a little longer to get that one done compared to Trevor Bain. Ten years later, boom, another first-time winner. Then add on another 10 years later with Michael McDowell and Derek Cope's early incident on lap 3. Oh my god, that is so damn freaky. I, oh my god. Speaking of freaky, I'll continue with even more talk of the number 3. In 2014, the second year of the Generation 6 car, Richard Childress announced he would return the number for full time racing after removing it entirely due to Dale's death for years. And he chose his grandson, aka 2013 Nationwide Series champion, Austin Dillon, to drive it. The car was going to be black and white, thankfully without a GM Good Wrench sponsor. And guess what happened? He won the poll. Yeah, that's freaky right there. I know for a fact that there are some fans out there that will call it rigged, and that word is frequently used for what would happen in Daytona 500 qualifying in both the previous year and the next year. Starting off with the previous year, 2013, Danica Patrick, the next up-and-coming female NASCAR driver, at least at the time, was en route to her first full-time season in the Cup Series, and lo and behold, she won the Daytona 500 poll over drivers such as Jeff Gordon and Kevin Harvick of all people. She would lead a few laps in the 500 and come home eighth, although on pace for a potential podium finish later in the race. Speaking of Jeff Gordon, he would rebound two years later which gets us to that next year of 2015. That year, NASCAR made the decision to implement a new qualifying system. To get this straight, let's just use the motorsport that actually uses the system fully right now. Formula 1 has a format where they use a set of knockout rounds called quarters. 
With their regular 20 car fields, the fastest 15 in quarter 1 makes it into quarter 2, and then the fastest 10 in quarter 2 makes it into quarter 3 to determine the top spots. As of last year, that format now includes an occasional sprint race that only occurs on certain weekends. NASCAR chose to use that exact format for Daytona 500 qualifying, and with the fact that cars could run in packs to gain the fastest times at any point during the session, that pretty much was a setup for anything to happen. With a minute and a half to go in literally just the first round, all hell broke loose, and Clint Boyer had a couple of choice words to say afterwards. And we're down to a minute and a half here, so we're running, uh, I mean, it's not going to be many more laps. Denny Hamlin goes to the top of the chart with Austin Dillon. Got Jake. one sideways. And around turn one in the wall. And that is Reed Sorensen. I think it was that quarter panel and the damage he had to the rear of that car that probably caused that accident. Clint Boyer had been trying to get past Sorensen to no avail. Checked and released, he's okay, but you're behind the 44. What do you see and what are you thinking? Well, first of all, I was behind the 44. He come flying around, come up on the apron, jumps in front of me, then runs over the 51, stacks us all up, and I run into him. It's just, it's idiotic to be out here doing this anyway. There's no sense in being able to, trying to put on some cute show for whatever the hell this is then you got a guy out there in desperation doing this crap like this i mean it's just there's there's no reason to be out here these guys have spent six months working on these cars busting their ass on these cars to go out there and have some guy out of desperation do that crap but it ain't his fault it's not it's nascar's fault for putting us out here in the middle of this crap for nothing there is absolutely we used to come down here and worry about who's going to sit on the front row in the pole for the biggest race of the year now all we do is come down here and worry about how a starting park like this out of desperation is going to knock us out of the daytona 500. we've been in meetings for 45 minutes just trying to figure out what in the hell everybody's going to do just so we can make the, the race. It's stupid. There's no sense in doing this. This gets even worse with the fact that the Xfinity series also used the format for their qualifying session. And what do you know? A wreck happens at the end of the first round because of a dumb move. Kyle Busch's clapping after it all ensues represents every single fan that chose to watch that day. Thankfully, the format was dumped by the time the Spring Talladega weekend arrived, and it hasn't been used for speed weeks ever since. Oh, and Jeff Gordon won the poll, but his time throughout the rounds wasn't even the fastest overall. It was Jimmy Johnson. So interpret that however you want to. Now, if I had to pick one time in Speed Week's history where the situation of the time plus whatever happened in later years featured the strangest detail ever, or just had a very negative vibe to it overall, I'd have to give it to Loy Allen Jr. in 1994. Loy Allen had a very odd and short-lived NASCAR career, and he's mainly referred to as a bust, which is expanded upon in a video by Black Flags Matter, link in the description. He was a driver that always put up incredibly fast qualifying speeds, or in other words, always had a good car on short runs. But it seemed as though every time he got in his car for race day, nothing ever came to fruition. He was extremely inconsistent at ARCA, albeit collecting some solid finishes and a single win in 1992. In a nutshell, he got rushed up to the Cup Series way too early, and in an unexpected fashion, he won the pole for the 1994 Daytona 500 with a speed that beat drivers such as Dale Earnhardt and Ernie Irvin, becoming the first rookie in NASCAR history to win it. That year's Speed Weeks can be remembered by many to be an extremely turbulent period of time, as there were two deaths and many scary crashes throughout the week. In the race, Allen never led a single lap and he finished 22nd. In six of the next ten races, he failed to qualify in, and you can add another six to that later in the season as he only scored four finishes above 20th. After that, it was only just over 20 more starts in the Cup Series, and he faded into darkness. It was as if winning the 500 pole was a further factor into a destiny a curse and failure for Loy Allen Jr. At this point, I think it's time to start getting a little more positive, so let's take a look at some statistical parts of this history. First, how about we dive into one of the more unbelievable achievements, being the luck of winning multiple Daytona 500 poles. Beginning on the low end, there are five drivers in history that have won it twice in their career. Only one did it before at least the 1990s, and that was Donnie Allison in 1975 and 1977. A part of the Alabama gang and a brother to legendary driver Bobby Allison, Donnie was mainly a part-time driver throughout his career, but that didn't stop him from accomplishing at least some feats. He did win some crown jewel races in his career, although none would end up being the Daytona 500. It wasn't even just him that won the 500 pole in his family, as Bobby, Donnie, and his late nephew Davey all claimed it at least once, with Bobby winning the race three times and Davey once. Gosh, what a family, man. The next driver to earn the feat was Jeff Gordon. However, his polls came in an extremely separate fashion, if that's a way to put it. He would become the sixth driver in NASCAR history to win the Daytona 500 from the pole in 1999, as he pulled off an extremely daring move late in the race that almost caused what would have been an awful accident, but god almighty it was beautiful, you have to admit it. He managed to hold off Dale Earnhardt, who was looking to score back-to-back -back Daytona 500 victories after finally pulling it off the previous year. This would be Gordon's second of three career Daytona 500 victories, with one being just two years prior in 1997, and then getting one later on in the mid-2000s. 
As mentioned before, Gordon got his second 500 pole in 2015, and that year began a streak of poles conquered by Hendrick Motorsports. In both 2016 and 2017, young phenom Chase Elliott drove what was originally Gordon's car onto the front row again. He would wreck only 20 laps into the 2016 race, and he was en route to winning in 2017, but a loss of fuel dropped him back to 14th with just 3 laps remaining. After 3 more Daytona 500s outside the top 10, he finally managed to finish well, scoring 2nd in the yellow flag photo finish in 2021. Taking the turn in 2018 would be newly hired driver Alex Bowman, a replacement for Dale Earnhardt Jr., who gave Hendrick a fourth consecutive pole, and then sophomore and 2017 Xfinity Series champion William Byron took the number 24 car back onto the pole position in 2019. The streak could have went to six straight in 2020 with Bowman had Ricky Stenhouse, I mean Ricky Stenhouse Jr. not won the pole. Bowman would take it back in 2021 though. With a new car coming this year, who knows if Hendrick continues to get up there. The only other driver to win two career 500 poles would be seven-time champion Jimmy Johnson in 2002 and 2008, along with scoring two to tail into 500 victories and also two victories in the Bush Clash. After that, we get to those who have won it either three times or four times. We already talked about Schrader's three straight pole setting run, but it wasn't just him that did it. The other three timers are Fireball Roberts and Dale Jarrett. Roberts achieved the feat between 1961 and 1963, including winning the 500 in 1962. Seems like he got the short end of the stick as in 1964, he suffered an engine failure in the 500, and a crash of the World 600 at Charlotte, now the Coca Cola 600, would give him incredibly severe burns, eventually passing away due to complications a few months later. And then we get to Dale Jarrett, who won his three poles in 1995, 2000, and 2005, with his third career Daytona 500 win being the 2000 race, which nowadays is referred to as arguably the worst Daytona 500 in history based on its racing product. Funny enough, Jarrett's first and second Daytona 500 wins would both be a Dale and Dale show at the end, as he passed Earnhardt on the last lap in 1993, and he managed to hang on by just enough in 1996. I find him so underappreciated for his Daytona accomplishments, to be honest. And finally, we get to those who are on the top of the chart for most 500 poles won, and there are three drivers at a tie that still remains to this day. Father of Chase Elliott, Bill Elliott, aka Awesome Bill from Dawsonville, is remembered for breaking many qualifying records during the 80s. Although the record for the fastest speed ever stands with his run of 212.819 miles per hour at Talladega, he actually claimed the record first at Daytona earlier in the year with a run of 210.364 miles per hour. Now, this is before the restrictor plates were implemented in the cars, and it was a time where safety was very iffy, so anyone could get away with speed back then. Elliott is the latest of the three-way tie in winning the most Daytona 500 poles, with his coming three years in a row between 1985 and 1987, winning the race from two of those years, and then not achieving the other one until 2001. Oh dear lord, we're back at that year again? Oh my god. We now arrive at a time where Richard Petty and David Pearson would have to fight for their lives when it came to the super speedways in the late 60s and the entirety of the 70s. Introducing Cale Yarborough and the gentle giant known as Buddy Baker, both are absolute beasts on the big tracks. There are two differences. One driver is statistically better, and the two drivers are extremely different based on how they race. Baker's nickname a gentle giant has a reason for why it's there. He never really bashed around with anyone, but his competitiveness was at an all-time high, as he won the Daytona 500 pole in 1969, 1973, 1979, and 1980, with one leading to victory, being the last year. Then there's the other guy who quite literally didn't give a single damn about who he messed around with. Haley Yarbrough could arguably be considered by people to be the greatest Daytona driver ever behind Dale Earnhardt, statistically speaking. Now, I understand that people may throw in a name like Richard Petty, because I mean, I guess loyalty and stuff, but let me get some facts straight, and maybe admit a take that Yarbrough was sometimes better than Petty on the big tracks. Yarbrough won four Daytona 500s, with two being from the pole, and he claimed four 500 poles throughout his career. To add to that, he won his respective dual race six times and the summer Daytona race four times. Unfortunately, Yarbrough may have never had the luck of winning in the clash as it wasn't introduced until late in his career, but he is right up there with Petty regardless. Of course, Petty having more all-time wins at Daytona would probably keep him up top in most people's minds. But I will repeat, Yarbrough was not a good fellow to mess around with. If you want to get a piece of irony just one more time, Richard Petty holds the record for the most Career Cup Series polls in NASCAR history at 123, while Yarbrough slips in at 69. <laughs> nice. Guess how many Daytona 500 poles Petty won? Just one. I'm not even kidding, out of all the poles that Richard Petty ever won in the Cup Series, only one of them was for the Daytona 500. So basically, he chose victory over speed, hence the 7 Daytona 500 wins. Now, do you see why I wanted to do a video like this? There's honestly so much more that could be said about the history of past Daytona 500 pole sitters, but at this point, I think we can conclude we've gone over well enough of what deserves to be mentioned. So there you go, that was an extended look at who's accomplished being the fastest winner in terms of qualifying for the 500. We're only a few days away from finding out who joins the history books with the all-new next gen, a 
perhaps Generation 8 car, and I personally can't wait to find out who will get the job done. Any thoughts on what we just discussed? Leave them in the comments. And don't forget to subscribe and share this with your buddies. My name's Riegzer, or Riggs for short, and thanks for watching, and I hope you enjoy the beginning of the new NASCAR season. Whoop whoop! Have a good one.